Next Smoke, I'm David Smoke, and Pete, thanks for your time. So I saw the story drop Friday with some reports about the IRS and nonprofit collectives and offering tax deductions that could be illegal. Can you kind of wrap your arms around that and explain to that to us in layman's terms what all that means? Yeah, so I guess the best place to start real quick is so you have all these NIL collectives spread across the Division One landscape right now. And some have registered as for profit, some are LLC, some are some are these non profits, right? And being registered as a non profit allows the collective to accept donations that are tax exempt, um, which then makes it a little bit more uh comfortable and, and more attractive to some of these top level donors. So yeah, the IRS put out a memo on Friday saying that uh from the activity that they've seen and the tax filings that they've received, they don't believe these collectives qualify to be these registered nonprofits and, and earn, earn that tax exempt status. But there's a lot to lack, excuse me, there's a lot more to it. Um, the IRS just can't like step in and immediately start stripping these 501c3 titles. And um, yeah, it, it's going to be interesting to watch. And, at the same time, where it was just a memo, it's not like a, a new bylaw, it's not a precedent. So, how does that evolve, and um, how do we see that? Does, does it become something the IRS doesn't brace? Pete, this couldn't have been, you know, much of a surprise. Just the discussion surrounding, like you said, nothing officially happening just yet. But um, what was kind of the reaction that you saw? I saw a number of collectives like putting out their, you know, their their statements of like, "Hey, we're a five hundred one and all of that." But but like you said, nothing's happened. So um, what what's been kind of the reaction? And does everybody just sort of stay pat for right now as is, or does does the move become, "Hey, you probably should start gearing yourself towards." you know, being under some other uh, label, if you will. Yeah, I think that, it, I mean, just from the conversations I've had, I think it's a lot of case by case, right? Like some people have been like, uh, I'm not going to change it how I how I roll right now until I feel like I'm, there's some pressure being put on me. Um, and then there's some folks who said, let me go talk to my attorney and see what, what the feedback is um, for my tax attorney. I think... I'm not really sure what the, the aftermath of all this will be, but it will be interesting to see what donor fatigue, uh, if, if that plays a role into it, right? A lot of these collectives already are struggling to raise dollars. Um, at some level, it, it, is this something that really drives away like your top level donor who could easily contribute seven figures and, and do they want to get, um, just in business with, an organization that might not be in the best standing with the IRS, however it shuffles up. All right, so for those who don't know, the money that a player gets, whoever it is, for with an NIL collective, the, the donor thinks it's tax deductible. The player knows they're going to pay taxes on that, correct? Correct. Okay. The, the question, I guess, that I have is, you see numbers that you guys have when it comes to NIL, whether it's Dylan Riola or a kid that's a three-star running back who's going to play for, I don't know, let's just say Missouri. How do you right. guys? How are you guys coming up with that? Other than the fact you're really good at what you do, and are some of those <laughs> are some of those numbers inflated? Yeah, I'm not going to say they're inflated, but I'll also just clarify that they are projections, okay. right? And um. They're calculated through an algorithm, and there's just like a, a handful of things that go into it. Um, but I wouldn't say that they are spot on. I think that we're just trying to give an athlete a projection of, of what they're worth. So, Pete, uh, what is kind of the, uh, I guess, next move as far as this goes? Is this a wait-and-see game overall and just wait on the government, which could be – I mean, in that case, who knows when? Or is there actually, a, you know, maybe a, a beacon on the horizon to kind of look forward down the line where something else may develop in, in, you know, in terms of this part of the story? Yeah, so, like, in terms of the IRS, I, I mean, I'm in contact with the IRS. We're trying to get some answers. I think that there's a lot of questions that need answers to and, and, and what it exactly means, right? So I think that's kind of wait and see. At the same time, I was in D.C. last week, and obviously mm -hmm. Charlie Baker and the NCAA are, are putting a whole lot of pressure on Congress to enact federal legislation 
Uh, it seems like the deadline for that is, is the end of the year, right before the 2024 presidential cycle kicks into gear. Um, but they, I got to tell you guys, it does not really seem like there's a lot of momentum to that. It doesn't really, I talked to some lawmakers last week, it, it doesn't exactly come across like they're enthralled by college athletics. And um, there's just the, the blunt and honest reality that, right, that, NIL and, and college athletics, like it's all really important and interesting to us, but is it really enough for a legislator to go home and, and run a campaign on? Is it more important than China and the Ukraine? I'm not sure about that. Pete, what was your overall take from, we had Brian Murphy from WRAL TV and I think Charlotte who was watching that on uh, online. What was your take about, that was it just a dog and pony show even though there were some alphas there uh or was just another meeting because charlie baker seemed to be at least more precise in how he presented their argument yeah i mean charlie baker was on point and it was very clear that he has a, a background in politics but at the same time yeah it did kind of feel like a dog and pony show and obviously the sec set up set up its delegation to the hill and i don't know it just doesn't really seem like it there's, there's the saying, right, like just being active doesn't create movement. I don't think we're seeing movement, and I just don't think that we're seeing uh, – obviously, Charlie Baker and, and the NCAA would like to see something done, but I don't think we're like close to seeing a bill come up for a vote. One last thing I'll say is, right, so college athletics reform has kind of been a topic on the Hill now for roughly four years, and I mean, not a single piece of legislation has even made it to a vote in, in the House or Senate, so – um, we can keep talking about it, and, and obviously it seems like it's the only thing the NCAA is going to do to try to enforce NIL, but it's just not a priority right now, and it uh, doesn't really seem like we're going to see anything for the time being. Yeah, man, every time that this gets brought up or Charlie Baker is going to do this or this twist is going to happen, um, I just feel like we the, the conversation keeps going in the same direction, and there's really just... I know that I know why the NCAA is begging for help, Pete. But it's just like you said; it just seems there's no sign. And I've just wondered. Okay, Charlie Baker was hired for a specific reason. He's doing that right now, and and we just you know referred to it. But you know, at what point do they? I mean, does it take another four years? At what point do they say like, okay, this is clearly not going to work out? So what do they? I mean, do they not have anything to pivot to? Is that part of the problem, or is it just hey? we're going to stay in this fight till we can't fight anymore. And, and that might be futile anyways. Yeah. I mean, the NCAA doesn't have subpoena power, which is the big thing. Um, but that we don't need to get into that conversation. I think the one thing that we should all keep an eye on though, is Greg Sankey and the SEC have teased the idea of trying to align all their state NIL laws. Uh, so, so then all the SEC schools are in the same playing field. It's not the kind of thing that's ha- going to happen overnight. Some, some state legislatures have, have kind of shut down until like January. Um, but I think that, that might be like the, the fix all, at least for SEC schools, um, that we could see come together in the next, uh, I don't know, six to eight months. With that in mind, uh, and a couple of SEC schools will be affected by this, but uh, each state's gone about kind of doing their own thing, right? And, and Texas recently uh, making a move in that regard as well, correct? Correct. Correct. Uh, Governor Greg Abbott signed the the new uh, law in Texas on Saturday, and it's a uh, it's a big middle finger to the NCAA. It kind of says, "Hey, you're not going to really be able to come in here and mess with us." Um, it also allows for the twelfth man plus entity that is in that's operating at A and M right now to like really uh, be able to happen without being touched. Uh, so yeah. And, so yes, there's a lot going on, uh, but yeah, I, I what the move made by Texas this weekend was smart. Uh, apparently, on Joe Klatt's show, Deion Sanders earlier today. In fact, I saw that you retweeted this that he is uh, nil is not a problem with me. Collectives are. What do you mean? What does he mean by that? Uh, so I, I mean, I don't know what your thoughts are on this, uh, but Deion's take was. Um, Athletes should be able to, to market themselves and make dollars off of brand deals and things like that. The thing that Dion really dislikes is these collectives that we have popping up all across the, the landscape right now that are 
truly turning this into a pay for play game and um, have the backup offensive lineman all of a sudden right has the power to like command X amount of dollars or demand X amount of dollars and how uh, a, a lot of this elite recruiting that we always love, love to talk about and follow has turned into bidding wars. That that's the part that Dion hates. He thinks that his quarterback or uh, whoever like. Yeah, like they're, they're probably marketable and they can sign an endorsement deal, but he does not like collectives. You know, I, I mentioned this earlier in the show. I don't think I mentioned it with you on the show yet, but uh, I asked a, a CPA on Saturday when I saw him about the reports about the IRS and the 12 page memo and it kind of what you alluded to earlier. And he said he read it. I showed him like a tweet or two from Ross Dellinger and he said to me, that's not that's not the law. Like that, you said it, it might be a memo. It might be something they're discussing, but that has nothing to do with right now. Correct? That it's not a legal issue. Right. Yeah. Spot on. So, so. who do you think has the best NIL, or what are the best uh, collectives in your opinion? Uh, Tennessee, Oregon, A and M, uh, Texas, and Austin. Uh. Who else? I think USC is doing it uh, pretty successfully right now, but I don't know how much money they have in their bank, but they seem to be doing pretty well. Right? They just got Barry Alexander out of the transfer portal. Uh, Auburn's been pretty successful. Uh, you, you look at some more Big 12 schools, I think Texas Tech has done a pretty mm-hmm. outstanding job. Um, Oklahoma is setting the framework to be successful. I think it'll be interesting to see how that goes when they make the jump to an SEC uh, ACC wise, I think Florida State is probably like a, a, a big dog right now, and uh, Clemson has uh, been pretty successful. Um, and in the Big Ten, it's I mean it's no surprise there. It's in Ohio State, uh, uh, Wisconsin, I would say is actually pretty good as well. And uh, Penn State and Michigan are, are trying to figure it out. So everyone you mentioned is kind of in that blue blood category. Texas Tech, of course, has a really good nil situation going on they're not blue blood although they're successful in certain things but it, almost every one of those aren't those among the elite blue bloods in college football yes i would say so and i i mean i'm not if, sure if you guys have ever really delved into this but if you really look at things closely right like the richest states in the the institutions with the largest alumni base and, and most successful Alumni are the schools that we're constantly talking about being successful in NIL because they just have uh, the richest fan base, right? Like it's not uh, the it, it's not really a stunner, right? But like the, the Texas, I mean Texas is an extremely rich state uh, with with oil, and um, the thing I like to look at sometimes is endowment size, right? And like A and M has one of the largest endowments in the country, and you can compare it right next to the Ivy League, like. So I think that's a that's a good way to look at it, and uh, yeah, I, like you said, the blue bloods are, are continuing to win, but we're also seeing some schools that maybe have not been in the spotlight kind of come back around. And, and right now, like a Tennessee, like really mm-hmm. was not finding this rate of success like it has been um, for the last fifteen years. So just just interesting to see how NIL is kind of making college football evolve. Yeah, I think in some cases for schools like UT, UT, Tennessee, and Texas, it came along at just the right time to kind of give them a little bit of a boost, not that they weren't maybe trending. Somebody wanted to clarify, I mentioned almost all of them, Blue Bloods, I mentioned Tech, obviously have respect for them, but someone said, don't put A&M in the Blue Blood category. There's always the argument of who is and who isn't, and when it comes to college football, no matter their massive alum, alumni base or whatever, they are not a college football blue blood, but they act or try to act like one. All right, Pete, thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it, buddy. Always good to follow you on Twitter and get a chance to talk with you on the show. You bet. Awesome, guys. Have a great Wednesday. Pete Nakos on Bye-bye. 3.com. Thank you very much. Yeah, so.